Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Five Drinks Your Midnight, the show where we bring the questions, guests bring the drinks, we try to wrap up by midnight. Today we're talking to John Holman from Holman Distillers. Don't know who John Holman is? It's okay, you soon will. New York Times just did an article, and he's the guy that's bringing back Applejack, America's first moonshine. Let's log in, see what he's doing, and let's learn about some Applejack. Five drinks, five questions, or midnight, whatever comes first. John, thank you so much for joining us. Five drinks or midnight. Five drinks, five questions, whatever comes first. How you doing, sir? Thank you so much for joining us. I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me. Excellent. I'm uh, thirsty. Uh, me too. I can't wait to dig into these. This is uh, uh, one I've, I've had fellas all over the North Carolina searching for these for me. And so <laughs> I'm really excited. I can't wait to crack these open. Uh, I guess our first thing, what do we drink at first? We're going to have a Jack Rose, a traditional Jack Rose with my Apple John. All right, excellent. So that is the dark black, bottle. Black bottle? Yeah. All yeah. right. Now, I, again, as you can see, I haven't opened this, but I, th if, I, if I'm correct, I think you might be able to uh, accomplish a bucket list for me. Okay. So hang on. I just want to crack this open. So this is... Uh, this is a funny story to me about this because originally when I first did my first Apple John, since this is a Jack spirit, the color is all apples, all the organics from the apples. And I was really concerned about um, photochemistry going on with the um, liquid inside. And this is a prime example, like the Granny Smith, the color is all apple. And uh, my original blue label was in this clear glass. And I got nervous about photochemistry. So this is my second blue label. And what I wanted to emulate was, since this is an old timey beverage, the old timey bite cork from the bar. So yes, that is my, that's what I was hoping for. Cause that is my bucket list is doing. There you go. There you <laughs> Don't do that one. <laughs> Not for new ones. I haven't obviously opened that one. These. I asked for bite corks from my supplier and they looked at me odd. And so what I did was take a tapered cork and beat it in with a mouth. Excellent. Look, and when this showed up, I was very much, I was like, oh, why is that? Like, I, I was very confused. On, and then I was like, oh, I think that's an extended cork. And then I was like, oh, it's going to give me my bucket list of being able to pop that <laughs> over. So I'm super excited. So All that right. was my... That was my intention was sunglasses for the liquid and then, uh, you know, an homage to old Westerns and that kind of movie. That is awesome. All right. So Jack Rose it is. Hello. It's a constant, that's a, it takes about 60 apples to make one bottle. The color's all apples. It's a, it's the concentration of hard apple size. So the Jack Rose, the Jack Rose cocktail normally is made with Calvados or apple brandy. Um, it's referred to as a three sour cocktail. Apple brandy ain't sour. If you try my Apple John, it is, it's sour. And so this, the sourness of the spirit mixed with the uh, pomegranate, sweetened pomegranate or grenadine and that splash of lime over ice. It, it's my favorite. I love oh, it. It's, it's so good. And to that little trick with the splash of lime, that, that just, ah, oh, it's just, really brings that out it's so fucking nice it's dangerous too mm -hmm. i mean it'll it'll uh oh. and you gotta use real grenadine can't use hummingbird food you gotta use sweetened pomegranate juice not red yep. sugar water yep i did that I, I followed your recipe to the tea so uh, excellent thank you went out and bought it and ended up making like three mason jars full of it last night so uh was giving them away to neighbors and everything this morning because I was like, I got so much of this. I'm like, so you can store it in the freezer and it'll last for about four to five months. Mm. So I make it, I make it in larger batches and then store it in the free. I even store this in the freezer and just pull it out a little bit beforehand and then it's kind of ready to go. Nice. All right. So then on to question one, it, it's more of a little origin story kind of thing, but did you know that you wanted to get into the spirits business when you were studying chemical engineering at North Carolina? 
Wasn't studying chemical engineering. I was studying chemistry. I wanted to go to medical school. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. My, my, uh, my terrible uh, uh, social stalking was really terrible there. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're close. It's it's uh, well in the in the time story. The I believe the other lady or the other person was one of the persons. There was another person making apple jack. I believe she was a chemical engineer. Oh. It's funny because on the set or on the on a side note on some of the notes or whatever, somebody posted, he goes, I don't know much about Applejack, but I know that most chemistries, uh, most chemistry people must be in the alcohol business. If you <laughs> major in chemistry, you end up in alcohol. But I, I want, I originally wanted to go to medical school. I wanted to father, follow my father's footsteps in the medical school. But um, when I ended up graduating, I, I didn't care. I didn't really want to go for any more school. And then at that time, after you graduate, what do you do? I wanted to end up way back when I wanted to end up farming. I wanted to farm. I wanted land. I wanted to farm. And so at that point in time, uh, I think it was 97, 98. I had, um, I started looking at if I was going to farm, what I was going to farm and it was grapes. And so since I was like for chemistry and medical school, I originally went on a couple of interviews for pharmaceutical sales. Um, and then through my college at the time, I got a note about a sales job for a California winery. And uh, I was like, oh, this could be interesting. And I was like, you know, it's, it's a sales job, pharmaceutical sales. And I was like, it's farming, it's a winery. I was like, let me go talk to them. I ended up working with them for 16 and a half years. I didn't think I'd do anything else. I did the first 12 on the wine side and the last five um, on the spirit side of the business. And that was managing distributors, brokers. And then when I was in North Carolina managing our spirit business at the time, there was just a random opening. My wife, I got married uh, two years before that and she got a little bit sick of me traveling for my job. And so I saw at the time in North Carolina, there were about 200 wineries or about 200 breweries and there were about 30 distilleries. And I was like, well, dang. I was like, you know, they changed the laws in 07. I was like, here's this craft movement that's going. And I was like, ah, I was like, well, I was like, I know how to make it. I was like, I've been long enough as far as how to sell it or anything else. So I was like, yeah, hey, you know, I'll, I was like, I can do this. I convinced my wife into it. And then we started looking for this and this. And every time we ran into a hurdle as far as trying to start, I tried to start numerous times. And, uh, the only way I could start is I, I'm unlike any other distillery. It, it's me. I make all this. I do all this. Um, and everything that I make, I'm, I'm the only one that makes it. And that's how I actually started. I wanted to make, I wanted to make muscadine spirits. Um, the end of that time story, since you read it, you know, she ended it by saying, you know, nobody ever asked me what apple is. Well, that, that came about because I started, I wanted to make muscadine baklava. Um, my first, my first muscadine baca was named Spur Baca. This is made from Carlos muscadines. Uh, muscadines are a uh, native grape to the south. If you drink wine, Chard Cab Merlot, I don't know what your familiarity is with like grapes and things, but very little. Wine, well, wine you've heard of, I'm sure, Chardonnay, yep. Cabernet Merlot. Yep, yep. What, those grapes are called Vitis vinifera grapes. They're bunch grapes, very thin skin. Muscadines are southern grapes. Um, they're cousins of those grapes. They're called Vitis rotifundia. They have really thick skins. Um, they're high in acid. They're fantastic for you. You eat them seeds, skins, and all. They have a really unique taste. I wanted to make vodka out of it, so I made that one out of Carlos. Then I, make a, I made a gin out of Noble. This was my Noble Mountain Courage. I, I didn't think I could sell two um, varietally specific grape vodkas, even though that's what they are. And uh, as I was going out and I was trying to taste people on my vodkas and my muscadine things, the first person I went to and tried it on, um, I got to him and I was like, it's made from muscadines. And the man went, what's a muscadine? And I was having a bad day. I was kind of bent and everything else. And I was driving home and I called a good friend of mine and I, you know, I was, I was uh, venting about you know, he was like, what's a muscadine? And he listened to me for a little bit and he stopped and he went, let me ask you a question. Has anybody ever asked you what an apple was? 
because he knows where my farm is or anything else. And I was like, hmm, kind of hit me at the heart there. And I was like, you know what? I was like, I got enough hurdles in front of me because I make unique things. I was like, I got to explain it to everybody else. I was like, I don't really want to explain to everybody what a muscadine is. And so the farm that we bought to start our spirits on uh, is in the middle of apple country. And so I was like, you know, I was like, man, I was like, so I started looking around. I started making my, I made my first apple brandy, which was made just from Pink Ladies. Um, it's named Mofo. Um, this was just Pink Lady apples. Um, I wanted to stay with varietal, um, just a single varietal fruit instead of a blend of a bunch of different apples. So I picked the Pink Lady. Pink Lady is really on the fence as far as acidity, sugars, and tannins. And I wanted to see how, uh, I started reading about how people make apple brandy, read a lot about Calvados, um, really the history of it, how they make it, uh, American apple brandy, uh, a bunch of different people from Slilovitz to Plum Blunt Brandy about how a bunch of different people were making and have made it for eons. So made it, I aged the ferment, which is a unique thing that I do. It's uh, actually something done with Calvados a lot where they'll age their ferments, um, they'll age their cider ferments before they actually take them through distillation. And uh, that's a lost art in a world of speed, um, of trying to go faster. And so um, everyone, I've aged them experiment. They've been experiments and different. When you, if, if you pour my apple john, you'll notice that it's significantly dark. That I aged it for three times as long as I did my first ferment. Um, to pick up some oxidation out of it to try to see what the effects were. And so I've always um, kind of, I was reading through that and trying to experiment, trying to find it. And as I was reading through Apple Brandies, I came across a story. It was entitled, uh, You Don't Know Jack. And uh, this was in a artisan distiller's magazine and I think 15 or 16. I still, it was um, uh, written by a nam man named Harry Haller which I emailed him and thanked him for the inspiration, but that was a story about Applejack. And uh, that's how I started making, trying to figure out how to make Apple John. Um, I quit making it three different times because I couldn't figure out how to make um, the Jack spirit. It's something that died over prohibition. This, this method of alcohol manufacture hasn't done, been done commercially really since prohibition. Um, some people still make it, they'll make, crude versions of it through their freezers or anything else, but commercially it isn't made. There's a lot of stigma around it. Um, when I made it, like I said, Apple Jack and Apple Brandy for the federal government mean the same thing, but there is no real direction or anything over what a frozen concentrated spirit is other than a distilled spirit, because I mean, they're, they're polar opposites. Um, you know, the, my Apple John and my orange, these are all the same ciders. This is jacked or frozen. This is an unaged distilled, and this is the same distilled aged for two years. So this is the continual experimentation of one particular hard cider. How about that for an answer? That was no, that was, <laughs> that was amazing. Again, I love that. Like that is, uh, again, I, I love people's origin stories and how they get into the business. I think it, it it's so damn interesting. So, I mean, and also this is just way too fucking dangerous. I'm already done, and like I just. You I can't wait for you to try it straight. It's some, it's 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 something straight. You like sour things? I do. Is this this will be interesting to see what you think of this straight? I've been so I've been making this now for. I brought my first one out in uh, eighteen. In the beginning of nineteen, end of eighteen, and I tell you what, when I first made this, I try I finished it. I quit making it three different times after I read that story. I couldn't figure out how to make it. And I finally figured out how to make it. And I went and tried it and I hated it. And then I went from hating it to loving it, to hating it, to loving it, to hating it, to loving it. And finally ended up taking it out and started tasting uh, bar people and restaurateurs on it. Every time I got to the end of the story and they tried it and they tried it straight. Now I'm smart enough to have people taste it in the Jack Rose first and then try this because you, it's it's like baker's chocolate different and if yeah. you tried a dessert with baker's chocolate first and then ate the baker's chocolate you would find the chocolate palatable if you did that in reverse and ate the baker's chocolate first you'd be like, Ugh. yeah 
yeah, and then yeah. you finally eat the dessert and you even make the dessert less palatable. So this is kind of like, I, my, it's my bartender's ketchup. It can be used for about anything apple because it's a concentrated apple, but it's just super different. Awesome. Seven. Yeah, that is so it's got, it's got vinegar characteristic to it. The color's all apples. Like I said, this is the concentration of the organics of the apples. An apple for alcohol is essentially three things. It's acids, tannins, and sugars. We take those sugars and we convert them into alcohol. And now we have acids, tannins, and alcohol. We remove the water out of it and concentrate those three things. And that's what this ends up being. This is the concentration of all the organics of the apple. It's to me is a better taste. It's a better taste than apple cider vinegar. Um, that's easily to be balanced with sugar. If you, I've had, if you ever had apple cider vinegar, it's the, it's yeah, it's yep. hard to make it palatable in my opinion. That's why people tell you to drink shots of it with different things so you yep. can get it by you and pass. Uh, I can drink this. I put oh, this on ice. And <laughs> amazing. I, I yeah, I'll drink this any day. Yeah, so this this actually I aged this ferment um, for three months in uh, place of one, and then I also did some other post aging on this one. I have this one, like I said, I took this one and I also have it setting in a couple different vessels for aging as well. So this has been my third one. Um, my other ones haven't experienced any photochemistry, so I'm toying to go back. I'm toying with going back to clear glass, but I don't know. I still like the bite cork package. So uh, again, I mean, I'm gonna go with the bite cork because <laughs> you gave me a bucket list. Like I got the, I got the fucking pull it out with my teeth. Like I, <laughs> again, not a badass, but I feel like a total fucking badass. I just like pop that cork with it. Like, that is fucking amazing. I love it. My whole goal when I started is I, I, you know, competing in the spirit business is you're competing against millionaires and billionaires and um, multinational uh, corporations with unbelievably deep promotional pockets, marketing, sales forces, everything. You know, when I started, my opinion was my only hope of differentiation was to be absolutely completely different. And with my wine background, um, particularly with the, the education, when I started, when I transitioned from my, the winery I worked for over into the spirit side of the business with them, um, fortunately, my company then was huge about education. I got to uh, study a lot about spirits. I became what's called a certified specialist of spirits. It's by the Society of Wine Educators in California. Um, really good, vigorous uh, program as far as making sure you have to learn a whole lot about spirits and particularly the history of them, and nuances of them. And, uh, you know, that's why I started as I was like, I was like, God, I was like, why doesn't anybody use fruit and take, and just the same way you would make varietal wines, take those fruits to full completion into spirits. Um, because there's, there's value, there's flavor to be had in that being that specific. Um, I'm, Huge whiskey person, bourbon person, love them. Uh, wouldn't mind making them. Everybody else in the world's making them. I figured I couldn't throw, I threw all my money at this already and I've been close to going broke numerous times. And I was like, I, I can't jump in that pool. It, it, you know, you could make the best damn thing on two legs, but um, what are you going to charge for it? How much are you going to sell of it? Where are you going to get it to or anything else? So all of my stuff is just, it, it's an added level of complexity because I have to teach people about it, but it's, it's entertaining. Well, no. And that, that, that's why I too, like I reached out after reading that New York times article. Cause again, I mean, kudos to being in the New York times and everything, but like, it was something so different that like, you weren't just another guy trying to make, you know, uh, whiskey or whatever. You were actually bringing back a, uh, you know, like you said, a lost spirit, uh, to, to the you know the modern times which and again I know very little about Applejack so like I was just like this just seems amazing so again uh, right now I, again you got a fucking fan for life now because this is just I mean from the Jack Rose to this like again I, even starting with this this was just fucking amazing so like this I mean we could 
make put this over ice cream you can put this over i think just about anything like this would just be great over just about anything so any sugar will work with it i've had i have a couple customers that cook with it um i mean it's you know i it's it's old it's something that people would have done a long time ago to give them safe you know the so this Everybody in this country, every person on the colonial side of this country had apples, like I said, with Johnny Appleseed. They took their apples, they fermented them, they made hard cider out of them. That way they had safe beverages to consume, to trade, to barter. I mean, it's used as currency. There's many different things they could use for it. The problem with hard cider is hard cider will go bad. And then way back when they didn't have chemical preservation or refrigeration to take care of their spirit. And so how would they get through summer months? So what they would do is they'd take that hard cider, they'd stick it outside in the harsh Northeast winter. When the ice or the water component of that hard cider would freeze and float to the top of the barrel, they'd push the ice off. All winter season, they pushed the ice off. What was left was Applejack. The color's all apples. Um, this is stable in that it, you don't have to refrigerate it. Once you open it, you don't have to worry about it going bad. It won't pick up viruses or bacteria. It's about 20% alcohol. Um, I had a customer ask me what the shelf life of it is. And I was like, I don't know. I think it could last almost forever, depending on how you protect the um, acid and whatever other factors can happen to it. Because as it sits in the bottle, if it's sat in the bottle cork, getting it hot's not going to matter. Getting it cold's not going to matter. Um, it doesn't get light. It doesn't even get air. And even if it did get air, it's not going to, you know, they could take this and they had it, they would bring it around. They could easily consume it. It was safe to drink. They would sweeten it with honey or raisins. And then that would be able to balance the acidity in it and made it palatable to drink. Um, it picked up uh, tremendous nicknames like hedgehog quills, horn of gunpowder, um, the, the acidity that's in it, you know, uh, the beverage ended up picking it up. Hell, it picked up its own disease. People called it apple palsy when you were drinking Applejack and you ended up getting drunk. It wasn't that you were just drunk on Applejack. Now, it was something different. You were, you, you had apple palsy. Um, that, when I heard, when I, when I was reading about that and I read the story about Applejack, I was hooked on that. I was like, holy shit, they made up a disease about it? I was like, this stuff's got to be great. <laughs> Let me try some of that. I want some. I was of that. like, "Oh my God! Whoa! Oh, oh, oh. Hmm. Well, I mean, it was you know, the prohibition in this country was a temperance movement against alcohol. It was a religious movement against alcohol. Um, you consider that point in period, apple was the sugar of this country. The apple was demonized. Um, we lost hundreds of native variety of apple trees. Uh, the apple business is still and still declining now, as far as going down. There's some revitalization as far as what goes on. But I mean, even where I am around here, most apple orchards here because they won't make alcohol or sell me to make alcohol out of it. I mean, they're ripping up trees. It's a wow. tale of two worlds as far as what it could be and what it is. Just kind of what it developed through, through that kind of temperance mentality of, you know, alcohol is bad. Whereas, hell, this was the water. Uh, this is the only reason humanity existed. They didn't drink water. They drank alcohol. They didn't drink it to have fun like we did. It's, you know, it's not a necessity for humans to consume, but it's a tolerable toxin that, you know, yes, has bad sides, but has a few ups too. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess on to question two, I think you might have answered it already, but just in case, what the hell is jacking? And I hear you do it the old way. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, and uh, Jacking is the opposite of distillation. So when we have a distilled spirit, uh, if you see an apple jack that's labeled as a distilled spirit, which is I have also, um, I'm thinking about changing that, but just to confuse the hell out of people. So I, that's why I named it Apple John, Apple Jack. And I figured, oh, hell yeah, this will just get it on down the rabbit hole. What is this? And you know, maybe I can, you know, cause some more confusion and you know, who knows. So distillation and the jacking of alcohol. Distillation is done with heat. Jacking is done with uh, cold or frozen. And so distillation, that works because water boils at 212 and ethanol boils at 173. That variant allows us to separate the ethanol and leave the water behind. 
The jacking of alcohol works because water freezes at 32 degrees and ethanol freezes at minus 173 degrees. Just like if you put in an 80 proof alcohol or an 80 proof vodka in your freezer, it won't freeze. It becomes a little bit more viscous and goes around, but it doesn't freeze. That's because the combined uh, freezing point of that beverage is much lower than your freezer would be. You would have to get an 80 proof vodka somewhere around minus 40 to get that to start freezing and get cold. So the jacking process is that. Um, it can be a misnomer. Some people will refer to it as frozen distillation. It's actually not a distillation, it's a concentration. The difference is a distillation is the actual separation of alcohol where you're actually separating the alcohol from the water and you're actually separating the individual alcohols. A frozen concentration or the jacking of something isn't really the constant, it isn't really the separation of alcohol. You're affecting the concentrations, excuse me, of all the alcohols. And so it's a, the exact opposite. And hence the, the color that's in this or anything else are the actual solids that are in the apple. Distilled spirits are always clear because that's an evaporation and a, and a condensation. And so that will always leave color behind because color is a solid. And so solids will not evaporate and condense over. So all distilled spirits are clear. And then that's why this Jack spirit has such a rich color. That's the actual concentration of the organics of the apple. And then some of it actually um, oxidizing to some degree, but the oxidation is tremendously. Can we move on to question three, drink three. All right. All right. So uh, the red label over ice. This is my Holman's Applejack straight. This is an unaged white apple brandy. It's the same hard cider as my Apple John that you had. This is distilled on a reflux distill. It's, it's distilled slow and low. It takes me about um, 15 hours to separate this alcohol and I use just a very neat portion of it. It's diluted back with my farm's drinking water, which is damn near perfect water. It's some of the purest water on this planet. No runoff in my water. My water tests better than distilled water. I'm addicted to my water. It's unbelievable. And this is one of my favorites, apple brandies. Apple brandies this is one of the things that you'll see white apple brandies. A lot of white apple brandies are uh, rough, raw, uh, Calvados and everything else. They're not any unaged apple brandies. They're all aged. My opinion is most apple brandies, almost all of them are limbic distilled. The limbic distillation is a, a single process. Um, you can't really use a double or a thumper in this process where you run through in the limbic style. Um, some of the Calvados actually do use doublers with their preheaters and everything else. But when you run this through in a batch process, um, the separation of alcohol is small. They keep a lot of the congeners and a lot of the off alcohols with the flavor, with the brandy as it comes off and then age it for a long time. I can distill this pure. It's not distilled up to a vodka level, but it's close. And then it's no charcoal filter. There's no filtration on this. Just put back on my water. Uh, when you put ice on it, opens it up. This, this one will sneak up on you. You'll drink this one. It's just got really good flavor as, the, as it dilutes some. I, I love this one. Damn. All right. I see you. That, that, the flavor that's left, that's left in it. It's a faint bite, but it's, it's, um, yeah, I, this one, I, I love this one. Oh, this is just really good. This is just. Yeah. And I also loved it because it also, it totally makes my ice disappear. So even <laughs> though there is ice in there, uh, again, you talk about your water. I talk about, I, I'm a big ice snob. So I know like what it, it, it is about water and so yeah like my perfectly clear ice cube is just excellent right there and now that's just just like drinking water right like that's <laughs> absolutely this is burnt wine at its finest oh excellent all right so question three then i read that you take a fine wine approach to making all all of your spirits 
And again, your recipe is a secretly guarded recipe, not looking for the recipe. But can you talk to us a little bit about your, your process and in, in making all these wonderful spirits? Sure. The, um, so my fine wine approach is I try to keep a lot of single varietal fruits. Um, unlike other distilleries that are... They use a lot of cheap, readily available materials, and their main objective is to give you a consistent product year on year. Anything else they get, they want consistent color, consistent taste, consistent product. All I'll offer you is consistent fruits. And fruits, as far as I find the best fruits I can get, um, I ferment them in a very specific way as far as to make sure that I carry and keep as much flavor as I can on. Um, I do everything slow. Uh, everything's in reference to quality, not in time, uh, which a lot of distilleries, it's hard to be able to put money on one end and then wait for it to mature to get to the end. It, it gets in a rush where you, you got it over here, you got to get to the finished product and get it out. Now, having the fine wine mentality, it, it doesn't always work that way. Um, sometimes you need the ferment to age, you need the ferment to rest. A clear spirit like this um, spends a good bit of time in stainless steel because the lower boiling points in this distillation or separation, the airing, letting something breathe like this lets the lower volatiles kind of evaporate and go away. Um, you don't, you do lose some alcohol and you lose some product, but that really can help the finished taste of the spirit because the, the nastiest alcohols are the lowest boilers. And even, even this beverage that's been separated still has a concentration of them because you don't effectively remove everything. So the more you can kind of sit there, those volatiles will separate themselves and a good bit of them will just evaporate and kind of go away as you sit. So everything I do is for the end product and it's not based on because I get there faster. It's because it will make it better. I think it'll make it better when I get to the end. So it's been a, a lot of experimentation. Um, I'm, I'm a big experimenter, but I also don't do tinker with small batches and then throw them up. I, I put my money where my mouth is. I figure out a good theory and then try to execute the theory the best I can. And so far, I haven't been bit yet. Well, that's so cool. can't go wrong there. <laughs> so far. Well, except for falling off the damn tank. But that. <laughs> See that little metal thing on the ground? Yeah, yeah. There's a, a small little metal L on the bottom of the tank right above it. My arm caught the corner of that stainless steel hook and uh, just kind of grabbed it and ripped it. Oh. And, uh, well, I was trying to – I was at the top of the tank feeling – uh, when I carry my apple juice over from crushing over here to bring it over, I had four drums up there and I was dumping each one over top, which I have a little pump to pump it over and dump it in. And I was moving from one to the other and there were two barrels on the pallet and I emptied this one. And so all the weight was sitting on one corner of the pallet. And normally I've been on forklift my whole life. I usually have the forks set out. But for whatever reason, I didn't that day. And I stepped on one end of the pallet and the pallet kind of bucked and it threw me off. And I reached and I tried to grab the, there's a a bar at the top and that's like the ladder rack. That's yeah, yeah. the ladder rack bar. I tried to grab it and I just missed. And the barrel is going to fall on top of me because it was coming down and it they weigh about 600 to 800 pounds full. And, uh, so when I hit the ground, I fell back like this, and that's how I fell, and I landed on that thing. I felt my arm bleed because I'm way out here in the country, so I grabbed my shirt and ripped it around, and I grabbed my arm. I counted to 10. I looked at my T-shirt, and I didn't bleed through it. Counted to 10 again, looked at my T-shirt, didn't, ble didn't bleed through it. So I was like, all right, I'm not going to die. I'm good. <laughs> and uh, basically just ended up getting stitches on – that was Saturday – no, that was – yeah – that was Saturday, and then no wait, that was Sunday, and then I got up Monday morning and had to finish the tanks. I was on crutches, I hurt my knee. I was, man, 
Wow. Yeah, it sucked. So when we were putting those labels together, I was like, I want 27 X's at the bottom. There you go. <laughs> Temple Jack seems to be a very dangerous business. So <laughs> I don't know if that's Apple Jack. That's just stupidity. <laughs> All right. So drink four. Question four. What are we drinking? We're drinking a Mountain Manhattan. This is my Holman's Apple Jack Black Label. Uh, sweet vermouth with muddled cherries stirred over ice. Salute. Hot damn. All right. That is good. Yeah, I, I love this one. Wait till you try it straight. So that's that's two years in Blanton barrels. Mm. I, I love Trace whiskey. I think... Um, Buffalo Trace is akin to my heart as far as experimentation with alcohol and how alcohol is made. Even though they're a large manufacturer, um, they do a lot of experimentation on alcohol and I, I think they got it right. That's why I love using their barrels. All of my age spirit comes from Trace barrels at the moment. And this is Blanton's. This is two years in Blanton's, X Blanton's. Oh, that's amazing. That is. Wow. And that's that the same as the white. That's the two years. That's the same exact spirit as the white laid down for two years. So that's our, our, our red label, but aged two years? Yep. Laid down the same spirit, split off, and then two barrels. I made two barrels of it. When I made my Apple John, then I distilled it, then I split it. And so that was the whole cider split in thirds from Apple John to my red label to my black label. This is what this is what I'm I've been I, I brought it out in September. It's, I finally bottled it in September. So this has been the thing I've been drinking lately. That's why I made it number four. I've been this is I gotta sell more of it because I keep drinking it. No, this is amazing. And, and two, like uh, just a black label. It's harder to find. Yes, it's limited. If somebody if somebody watches your uh, thing and wants it, email. Me. I'll do everything I can to get somebody product, but um, I really do. I, I try to do it as legal as I can. My responsibility is to abide by the state's law of which the purchaser's from. So whatever that may be or anything else. And since I've been in the alcohol business so long, I, I can't skirt the law. I'm trying to do it legal. I'm trying to just ship people the way it is. Man, but it's hard. It, yeah. it, to stay, to get in compliance to ship to another state is damn near impossible, depending on where you live. Well, that too, and every state is just completely different. Like, it just is absolutely insane. Like, well, because of prohibition. As a distiller, every state's a different country. So, question four then. You, you, you talked about uh, vodka versus American vodka versus EU vodka and like breaking down the European vodka and uh, what's the difference? So the EU and the United States have different classifications of vodka. So simplistically, the two differences are EU vodka can have discernible characteristics of its base. United States vodka should not. United States vodka should be devoid of any characteristics of its base. The two differences is EU vodka, if you're a potato vodka, you can have some similarities to what a potato is, corn, wheat, rye, uh, grapes, whatever it may be. In the United States, vodka really should be devoid of any characteristics of its base. In this comparison of the term vodka, the United States gets it right. I believe the EU gets it wrong. Um, but the EU... Uh, you know, Poland and or Russia invented vodka. So the sugar for those areas at that time was potato. The most popular misconception in this country, as far as education goes, if you ask the general consumer what vodka is made from, they will say potato. Um, because that's where vodka originated. It, it originated from an area that its sugar was potatoes, Poland or Russia. And so that's the biggest difference is that in EU, if you have a vodka with flavor and a flavor of the base, it's okay. So it can be a good taste in spirit and a good vodka. Um, 
in the United States, in my opinion, you should have no taste and then you're a good vodka. If you have taste, you're not a good vodka. You could be a good spirit and a terrible vodka because vodka is the one thing that can be made from anything. It can be fermented, fermented from any sugar and then it's a process of distillation and filtration to end up with a final spirit of a proof above 80 proof. And so that is kind of the difference as far as what it is. So vodka is a process. If you want flavor, anything you make it from can be something else. For example, if you take grapes, distill it to 190 proof, filter it with charcoal or some other processes to try to devoid it of its character, blend it back, maximum of 80 proof, then it can be a good vodka. If you want to take grapes and you want characteristics and flavor of the grape, it should be a brandy because you can distill it to 189 or less. You can dilute it up to 80 proof or anything else. It can have flavor and then it should be a brandy. That is the, that is the spirit to carry forward the flavor. If you're trying to put it into a, a world of you can't pick it up, what is it? Then that's where the vodka is. And that's where kind of my um, vodka comes out, my 148 proof. We'll go on to our fifth and final question, which is your vodka. So, I mean, we can go ahead and do a little bit of pour of a, oops, there we go, <laughs> your 148 proof. It's named for my road. My road is 148 turns and 14 miles. That again, I was going to ask that question, but again, so we we are done. So all right. So our our last and final question comes down to our Whiskey Wednesday coin. Uh, we can flip it. We can spin it. We can do whatever you want. Are are we shooting this? Do we sip it? What do we do? No, I want you to, so my point with vodka and my point with this vodka is that you asked me earlier the difference between EU vodka and American vodka. So EU vodka is allowed to have some remnants of its characteristic base. So if it's made from grapes, then it should have some characteristics of grapes. If it's from potato, should have some characteristics of potato. Well, in the United States, the characteristics of vodka should be odorless and tasteless. It should be devoid of what it's made from. There are many other categories that you can name your spirit. If you want to make a corn-based spirit, make it a whiskey, make it a bourbon. There are many other levels that you can make it for that. If you want to make a vodka, vodka is the only spirit that can be made from anything. It can be made from corn, grapes, wheat, grain, uh, potatoes, any fruit, any sugar, anything that you can ferment, you can make from vodka because it's a process. You take whatever sugar you want, you ferment it. From that fermentation, you distill it. You have to distill it to 195%, sorry, 195 proof or better. And then, then you're supposed to treat it with some processes to make it odorless and tasteless. It has to be bottled at 80 proof or better. And then you can call it a vodka. So vodka. Vodka comes from, it was invented either in Poland or Russia. They both quibble over who did it first. Well, Vodka is named from the word voda. Voda means water. So this is the original water. So to me, water should be odorless and tasteless. You should be able to pick it up, try it, and not be able to go, this is that one. So again, to me, a good vodka is something you pick up and taste it, and you taste another one. You can't go, that one's this, and that one's that. You, it should end up in a world that is just like, yeah, it's gone. So in the state of North Carolina, being a control state, the maximum amount of alcohol that we can sell here is 151 proof. So vodka is distilled to 195 percent, or sorry, 195 proof or better. And once it's distilled to 95 percent alcohol or better, 
then you have to water it down to a minimum of 80 proof. So in the state of North Carolina, the maximum we can sell is 151. So when I was bringing my vodka out, I didn't want to ever sell anything that I didn't distill. I first made my spur vodka. My spur vodka is a great tasting spirit and probably a terrible vodka because it actually has that taste. But I made it with the EU in mind that I didn't really want to strip it devoid of its character because it tasted good. It was something that I didn't need to take further. When I wanted to bring this vodka out, I really wanted to look at what American vodka is and what it should be. And again, odorless and tasteless. Being 151 capped, 151, most people, if you ask the general consumer in alcohol for 151, they'll go rum. They'll say Bacardi rum, that's rum. Yeah. I did not want to be confused with rum, so I wasn't about to bring it out at 151. So I started thinking about where would I bring it out? I wanted to bring it out close to that. My road, Brushy Mountain Road is 140, 148 turns and 14 miles. So I was like, 148 proof. I was like, that sounds like where I'm going to go. So I blew this down, made it 148 proof. That way I could, you know, get out of the confusion of rum and bring out a higher proof vodka, of which I tell people, stop buying water at the liquor store. Vodka should be water. It comes from the word boda, which means water. It should be water. You should not be able to taste it. 80 proof vodka, most of the times in the grocery store or the liquor store, you can taste it, whatever it is, it's 40% vodka and 60% water. So my platform is odorless, it's tasteless. If when we taste it here, you'll see that taste, you can taste six things. You can smell millions, but taste is six things over your tongue. So when you try this, this will bypass your tongue. You'll have no experience as far as taste. When it hits the fresh skin in the back of your throat, you'll know it's 148. But that burn, that part will pass quickly, odorless, tasteless. This is for your summer watermelon. All right. Well, here's to that. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. The part is, it's 148. The reason I want it straight, it's a lot of alcohol, but even at 148, it's tolerable. I'm sure, I don't know, do you have any taste other than apples? I'm sure you have, app, like for me, I have apples. I still taste apples. Huh. Apples from this, everything else. No, um, I, I, I do actually, now that you say it, like one, it, it burns in the ears. So like that, that's, you know, it's good. Like that's high proof. Because again, it, it's burning in the ears, so that that's really good. But like, yeah, uh, I didn't get absolutely. You're absolutely right. No taste whatsoever. But like, I did get a little bit of burn. So back here, but yeah, but my ears are all tingly. So again, it's amazing. So it's 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 designed to be used in half measures. That it's 148 proof that if you buy 80 proof alcohol, mine is twice what you can get for 80 proof. So it's double the proof, use your own water. Whereas that most 80 proof is 40% vodka and 60% water. Mine's a whole lot more vodka with good water. Use your own water to finish it out. Well, let's go ahead. We'll finish it up with our question five. Question five comes down to a flip of a coin. You can flip it, you can spin it, you can do whatever you want, but the coin gives us the answer. So, I know that you bought your farm based off of the water. Does water matter in the spirits? And I know the answer, but yes, does water matter in the spirit? We're leaving this down to a coin? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> all right. Fuck right. yeah. Fuck yeah. Water, if you have good spirits, you have good water. The proof maximum, sorry, the proof minimum for most spirits is 80 proof. 
80 proof is 40% spirit, 60% water. So that shows you alone that water is the predominant characteristic of whatever the taste may be. Water is paramount to good spirits. If you have good, if you have great water, I always say if you have great water, you have great, you have good spirits because the great water will counteract any this, any processing problems that you may have or have developed. So, John, thank you so much for joining us. It's been five drinks, not even close to midnight. Thank you so much. I value your time. Thank and you. again, I cannot wait till we drink in person. I think we're going to cause a great deal of mischief. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it.